The National Flood Insurance Program, or NFIP, has been effective in requiring development to be protected from damage associated with the base flood event. However, larger floods can and often do occur. In response to the increasing potential for larger floods, state and local governments may choose to adopt floodplain development standards that exceed the minimum requirements of the NFIP. In this video, we will highlight three of the most common steps states and communities have taken to go beyond minimum federal and state regulatory standards. Requiring the lowest floors of buildings to be higher than one foot above base flood elevation. Defining the terms substantial improvement and substantial damage to count the costs of improvements and repairs made cumulatively over a number of years and basing regulatory requirements for new and substantially improved structures on a larger flood event. These key terms and acronyms will be used during this presentation. You can find the terms and their definitions at the web address on screen. The NFIP only requires the lowest floor of a residential building to be elevated to the base flood elevation. A state or community may adopt regulations that require buildings to be elevated to some level above the base flood elevation. This additional elevation is known as freeboard, which is defined by the NFIP as a safety factor above a flood level for floodplain management purposes. Freeboard is the most common higher regulatory standard adopted by states and by communities that want to provide a margin of safety against flood risks. Requiring freeboard above the base flood elevation can help protect buildings from floods that are larger than the base flood event. Additionally, requiring freeboard above the base flood elevation may also help better protect floor joists, ductwork, and insulation located underneath a structure's lowest floor. It may also compensate for the uncertainties associated with hydraulic and hydrologic modeling and in the limitations of mapping. The extra cost of elevating an additional foot or two above the base flood is often minimal when compared to the total cost of construction. In return, however, the property owner will experience significantly lower flood insurance rates due to the reduced flood risk. The National Flood Insurance Program defines the term substantial improvement to mean any improvement to a structure, the cost of which is 50% or more of its market value before the start of construction. The community's floodplain ordinance requires that substantially improved structures must be brought into compliance with the elevation or flood proofing requirements for new construction. Over the years, a community may issue a succession of permits for various minor improvements to the same structure without triggering the need for it to satisfy the elevation requirements of the community's floodplain regulations. This has the potential to greatly increase the total damages incurred in a flood event. To counter this, some communities instead require that the cost of improvements be counted cumulatively over five or ten years or the life of the structure. If the cumulative cost of improvements made during that period of time equal or exceed 50% of the structure's market value, the structure must be brought into compliance with the elevation requirements for new construction. As was also discussed in Video 16, the NFIP defines substantial damage to mean damage to the structure by any origin where the cost to repair the structure to its pre-damage condition is 50% or more of its market value before the damage occurred. The community's floodplain ordinance requires that substantially damaged structures must be brought into compliance with the elevation or floodproofing requirements for new construction. It is not uncommon for there to be structures within a community that are frequently damaged by flood, but where the cost to repair those structures after each event never reaches 50% of their market value. Such structures often deteriorate over time. 
the solution some communities have chosen to deal with these types of structures is to revise the definition of substantial damage in their floodplain ordinance to cumulatively track a structure's repair costs over a multi-year period, typically 10 years. And if the structure's cumulative repair costs during that period of time equals or exceeds 50% of its market value, it is required to comply with the elevation requirements of a new building. The 1% chance flood is the NFIP's current standard for floodplain management purposes. As discussed in Video 8, the 1% chance flood was adopted by the NFIP as a compromise between smaller, more frequent flood events, such as a 10% chance flood, and larger, more infrequent events. Some communities have chosen to reduce their risk by adopting the 500-year flood, also known as the 2 tenths percent chance flood, as the event from which new development must be protected. The 2 tenths percent chance flood is represented as shaded zone X on firms developed with detailed flood insurance studies. On older firms published before 1986, it is represented as zone B. Regulating development to protect from the 2 tenths percent chance flood is an effective way to reduce future losses and may also account for changes in the community's risk resulting from potential future climate variability. The NFIP's Community Rating System, or CRS, is a voluntary incentive program that recognizes and encourages community floodplain management activities that exceed the minimum NFIP requirements. It accomplishes this by awarding points to a community for activities that FEMA has determined reduce flood damages. The more points earned by the community, the larger the premium discounts for those residents carrying flood insurance. CRS points are awarded to a community for adopting any of the higher regulatory standards discussed in this video. Today you have learned how communities can take steps to reduce flood losses by adopting floodplain development standards that exceed the minimums prescribed by the NFIP.